All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, hi, everyone. If I haven't seen any of you uh, since the morning, my name is Joanna Voronkovich. I'm co-director of the AEI Lab, so it's really great to be here. We have a great panel today. Um, we have uh, three papers, so we're going to stick to time. Just to remind you, for the presenters, we're going at 15 minutes for presentations, brief five-minute uh, discussion after the paper, uh, and then we'll have a longer discussion period at the end. I'm going to be keeping time, and the best way for you to know what time it is, if you're not keeping it on your own, is just to keep an eye on me. I will have a virtual background that gives you a three-minute warning, a one-minute warning, and a stop warning. So keep that. We changed the settings so that you can actually unmute yourself now if you want to jump in and ask a question, just to remind you, the um, try to keep clarifying questions for interrupt for during the presentation. So if you want to interrupt with a clarifying question, feel free, but then substantive questions should be, should be kept until the end. So other than that, I think we're ready to go. We're going to go in order. So we're going to have three papers, um, and we're going to start with... Ying Li's paper, move on to Jamie Levine Daniel and Frederick Anderson, and finish off with Jessica and mine papers. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, as you can tell from the title of this project, this is totally a new project in response to what happened since mid-March when the global pandemic hit us, um, because my original project was cut short, so I was kind of forced to pivot to this new project. Um, so I'm very happy to share some of the preliminary findings with this wonderful community, and I'm very excited to hear your feedback. Uh, so the title of this paper is, Is an Online Cinema Still a Movie Theater? The Unexpected Emergence of Virtual Art House Cinema at the, at the Confluence of the COVID-19 Pandemic and the Digital Age. Uh, so my motivation for this project started with a theoret uh, theoretical puzzle, actually. So in Carl Weick's uh, seminal article about sense making published in 1993, he described the Mangulch fire disaster, uh, where a crew of firefighters was trying to outrun uh, unexpected life-threatening fire. Uh, but suddenly, the leader of this crew shouted to everyone, uh, burn a hole around you, uh, squat, and drop your tools. So all the, crew, the, all the crew members were astonished because they didn't understand what the leader was trying to convey. Actually, the leader was trying to tell the, the crew uh, the idea of escape fire. Uh, so by removing every um, flammable materials around you, when the fire catches one, uh, catches the people behind them, there wouldn't be anything to burn anymore. However, the idea of the escape fire was not available in the training courses of firefighters in late 1940s. So the crew of firefighters just thought the leader must be crazy. How could we adopt this kind of totally counterintuitive approach. So none of them take the order and none of them survived in the end. And Carl Weick believes this is a problem uh, of identity because if firefighters use their tools designed to put out a fire, to light a fire instead, then who are they? Are they still firefighters? In a similar vein, I'm intrigued to ask this question. If movie theaters make their patrons to stream films at home, then are they still movie theaters? So the research question for this project is why and how can organizations innovate in a seemingly identity conflicting way when facing an existential crisis? Uh, in order to answer this question, I hope to uh, understand the behind the scenes stories. So I'm designing this project as a qualitative project and I have been collecting data from various sources, but most importantly, I have been conducting interviews with both, both art house exhibitors and art house distributors. So the majority of the interviews are focused on art house movie theater executive directors and programming directors who decided to adopt a virtual cinema uh, in the very first two weeks since the outbreak of the coronavirus. And nine of these interviews are conducted with art house distributors who were willing to offer first to run moving pictures to the virtual cinema size of these art houses. 
Uh, so before we um, dive deep into the concept of virtual cinema, I'd like to explain what is an art house. An art house is an independent movie theater that is committed to showing social engaging films, such as uh, documentaries, foreign language pictures, and American independent films that usually have a topic of uh, social engaging topics, such as uh, gender equality, uh, social justice, and LGBT issues, and environmentalism, etc. An art houses believe they are mission-driven and community-based cultural institutions. And by mission-driven, it means art houses believe they are very different from and even oppositional to mainstream chain movie theaters. For example, an art house executive says, chain theaters are cookie cutters. They are 100% profit driven. They simply don't care about films or people, but we do. We are curators. We make value judgments. So none of these people get into this industry of art house movie theaters to get rich. Uh, their mission is just to bring alternative films to, um, to people uh, who live in a world full of McDonald's and Netflixes. Uh, so, uh, the other part of the core identity of art houses, they are community-based organizations. So art houses believe they're very different from online film rental and streaming platforms. Art houses really trying to celebrate the authentic movie going experience by bringing people together in a physical place and created a sense of community uh, by being a curator of films instead of just like Netflix put a thousand or even 10,000 films in their film li library. However, when the COVID-19 hit the world, this was interpreted as an existential crisis for the whole film industry, from film production to film distribution to film exhibition. And most importantly, this is existential crisis for art houses because art houses are categorized into this non-essential business and they are forced to close for an indefinite period with no box office revenue and concession revenue at all. And moreover, the business model of art houses is just the opposite of social distancing. And uh, this is a critical period for competition as well, because um, the people will be more accustomed to watching films online. So the threat of streamers will be exacerbated during this uh, closed down uh, nationwide for art house movie theaters. So of course, the sense-making system of art houses totally collapsed. Nobody knows what to do and nobody knows what they can do. However, interestingly, uh, the virtual cinema initiative happened very quickly. Since March 19th, virtual cinema has been launched and quickly spread among the art house industry. Within the first two weeks, 99 art houses across the US adopted the virtual cinema. So what is virtual cinema? There is an official definition, but I'd like to show you through this demonstration. So basically a patron just to go to the website of an art house movie theater and uh, log in to this uh, virtual uh, screen page and click a link uh, for a film they want to watch. And then they buy this so-called virtual ticket. And then they are directed to this logging site. And actually they are logging into a distributor's website where the movies are hosted there. Uh, so the idea of watching movies online may not be a big deal for us uh, who are just uh, so used to watch films or other kind of entertainment on, on, on online space. However, the emergence of virtual cinema is totally unexpected for uh, both the external stakeholders to the art house community and internally. So externally, for example, the Washington Post commented, welcome to social distancing cinema, wherein the survival of brick and mortar theater depends on the technological innovation that was supposed to kill it forever. And internally, I have been uh, hearing from almost every art house exhibitor who are saying that um, this virtual cinema is something we never would have probably thought of doing in normal times. So the irony of virtual cinema is twofold. The first one is adopting virtual cinema seems to be an identity conflict and a mission drift for art houses. And second, uh, adopting virtual cinema seems to be a suicide in the long run because movie theaters are helping their audience develop a habit of watching films at home. So even after the coronavirus is over, people may not want to go back to theater anymore. 
So um, my preliminary findings for what what and uh, what exactly happened for the virtual cinema initiative is organized into four parts: adopting virtual cinema, effectuating virtual cinema, learning through this unexpected experimentation, and finally reimagining the future for art houses. But uh, due to the limit of time, I will focus on adopting virtual cinema and a little bit on effectuating in today's presentation. Uh, so the first step of my uh, preliminary findings is uh, I found, contrary to my prediction, which might uh, I might predict a long decision-making process and internal discussion within the art houses, actually virtual cinema was adopted pretty quickly. So everybody was saying that my gut told me to do it, and they just uh, jump on the idea of virtual cinema. So in order to understand why this adoption of virtual cinema happened in such a short time, I want to understand it from emotional, economic, uh, cognitive, and value-based reasons. So first, emotionally, I find that people are saying, we didn't want to appear bad. Uh, so as long as there is something that is still connected to the films that they committed to showing normal times, they're happy to do it. So basically here, Quick adoption can be driven by the emotional needs to make a response, actually any kind of response to restore a sense of normalcy for the art house community. And second, economically, uh, which might be the most important reason that we expect art houses to adopt a virtual cinema, but actually I hear from my interviewees that they said, we didn't expect to make a profit out of the virtual cinema at all. Uh, because in the beginning, uh, this was so new, uh, no movie theaters has ever tried to show a movie online. So nobody knows how to predict how much money this will bring into this theater and additionally there will be much cost associated with that because the typical art house only have one to three full-time salaried employees so during this unexpected unprecedented times many people just laid off and they need more bandwidth to seek for fundraising opportunities so not everybody uh, within the theater is ready to uh, to do the virtual cinema to serve as a customer service person during this time and as i mentioned before this could be a suicide in the long run. So here, uh, my quick summary is a quick adoption of virtual cinema is not, not so much based on financial prospect. And then third, uh, cognitively, um, the question is, what is virtual cinema? So people are telling me it sounds like streaming, but it's not. When I ask my interviewees, how do you define virtual cinema? They would say, well, I think it's a new, not quite cinema, not quite digital type of thing. And nobody knows how to categorize it yet, but it's not streaming. And uh, people are saying it's the same as theatrical as before, except it's totally different. So here, a quick summary of this cognitive uh, background information is uh, quick adoption may come from room for interpretation for a yet to be defined practice because nobody knows how to define virtual cinema. Is it theatrical? Is it video on demand? So there is such a gray area that is open for interpretation. And finally, which I find most interesting as well is uh, value-based reasons to launch this virtual cinema. So actually, this is not a mission drift at all to art houses. On the contrary, they think they are doing this um, uh, in a right way because our community needs us more than ever. For example, when I ask them, why do you, uh, what is most important factor for you to do this? People are telling me, I'm not immune to the long-term concerns it presents, but it felt like the right thing to do. And the, why is it the right thing to do? So first it comes to the power of film, these art house professionals believe in. So the whole point of watching a film is to build empathy. This unique power of film watching should be utilized to bring us together precisely because we're physically isolated. And even more, um, this art house community people believe community building is more important than ever uh, when we are all stuck at home. So they are saying, of course, it's not ideal, but that's the only way for us to engage with our audience. Is. These new things hopefully will carry over some of the art house community feeling online. So here we are seeing that means and ends are separate in the decision making process for art house people. Quick adoption is based on a deeper understanding of the ends and organization's value. 
So a summary for this adopting virtual cinema part is that art houses are not sure whether virtual cinema can help financially, at least in the beginning, but emotionally they want to do something and cognitively they perceive virtual cinema as different from streaming. Most importantly, they believe virtual cinema is a means to stay consistent with their values. So here we are actually observing two types of identity. All the identity I've been talking using example firefighters is basically all about categorical identity, whether it's theatrical, whether it's video on demand. But here we are also observing the importance of value-based identity that motivates art houses to adopt virtual cinema. Because the value is the same, still use the film as a media to build a community, even if this community has to be isolated at their own homes. So uh, that's the first part of the preliminary finding. And the second part is how to do virtual cinema in a specific art house. And what is interesting and what is probably most interesting is that we are observing art houses are trying to pretend that they are, they are still single screen theaters. So um, actually art houses usually have one to three screens in their usually historical buildings. So in normal times, they have to be very serious about their choice of films. They have to turn down some of the other opportunities because of the limitation of one single screen. But now in the virtual space, theoretically, they can show a limited number, limited list number of films, but they didn't do that. They still try to limit the total number of films they are trying to show. So there, here we are observing that a seemingly identity conflicting innovation can be effectuated in an identity consistent approach, as long as people are still aware aware of their identity and how to um, restore that identity, even if their identity is challenged in these times. And then step three, I will just gloss it over, is learning from the unexpected experimentation, is people try to improve the virtual cinema experience, try to communicate with each other, how to figure out the box office reporting, and how to expand the toolbox, all kinds of toolbox that can engage audiences uh, beyond the virtual cinema um, initiative. And then they are trying to build new relationships to sort of sometimes bypass the distributors to reach out with uh, filmmakers. Uh, and finally, they are doing even more creative programming. I have no left. And so just the last step is uh, this impacts how they interpret the digital tool for um, and how to embrace the digitization opportunity for uh, an unpredictable future. So in the future, they would be more comfortable in trying to use the digital tools to serve uh, for their own commitment and mission. So this is all my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ying. So let's go ahead and just do uh, one or two questions. Sure. Feel free to unmute yourself or raise your hand, either or. Okay, since I don't see any, I have a couple. So thanks for this good paper because it shows a great example of, I think, a model and practice, which a lot of the, if you were on the panels yesterday or watching the panels yesterday, we kept on getting questions about, well, what about models in practice? Is that, you know, can you, st can you stop talking so theoretically and abstract and give us what arts organizations and theaters, et cetera, are doing in this, in this time period, in this time, really what's going on on the ground? So I like that. And I like that you really go into the motivations for the model as well. I'd be interested to, um, this seems like a really good just uh, kind of first paper on this topic. And so my next questions that would arise from the work that you've already presented is one, what's the difference in pricing that you see between these virtual um, cinemas and the art houses that were previously presenting the same field? So are they adjusting pricing for that? Um, it would be great to even get ticket data on, you know, what's the take up rate of people who are watching virtual uh, cinema in their homes at this point? Um, I'm sure there's a different population that's taking advantage of this than that the population who was going to the art house in the first place. And then also just what are some consumer reactions to the shift? Um, I'm actually, I was thinking, you know, this could be actually a really positive shift. Some people just don't want to go to the movie theaters. We've seen this sort of trend in this direction already, even before COVID-19. So this might be, in fact, if you look at the consumer side, something really positive for the sector. So um, those were a few thoughts 
that I had. Does anyone else want to, do you want to respond to any of that? Yeah, if nobody else has questions, I'll I have a quick response to the question. Those yeah. are great questions and also the questions that the art house people hear a lot because at the beginning, they just uh, sort of did the virtual cinema out of goodwill without anticipating a lot of income. But as time goes on, they really need some money. So they are trying to uh, figure out how to monetize this virtual cinema thing. Mm -hmm. But they are not the people who set the price for a virtual ticket. So actually distributors have the power to set the price. And the distributors don't actually know how many people at home will watch this film together. So yeah, this is really a problem that even the distributors and exhibitors couldn't answer. Um, so they're trying to figure out a better model after theaters uh, can reopen because many of us, many of the art house people try to retain some element of virtual cinema, even if they're able to reopen. I think that will be the period when people would seriously talk about the prices of virtual cinema uh, compared to watching a film physically in an auditorium of art house. So, but right now a virtual ticket, it costs us $12, uh, approximately the same as a real ticket um, if, if you don't take any uh, membership benefits to watch a film. So yeah, that's, uh, that's the answer to the first question. The second is uh, consumer reaction. That's a great question as well, because I think my observation might be biased because I'm only uh, observing the positive reactions because people who didn't want to try virtual cinema, I mean, the consumers, they didn't, they didn't voice. Uh, so I don't know what they think of virtual cinema, but maybe they, um, they're just not so used to watch films online. But for those who tried virtual cinema, they are saying that they are very grateful that the art houses are still trying to offer them this opportunity to watch films. So they are really, um, they, they, they just uh, pass off to art houses who are trying to do this, even if they have a so unpredictable future. So that's, that's kind of uh, the picture from the audience's side. Okay. Thank you. And um, just because of time, I'm going to move on. We have four hands up. Mm -hmm. And also there's a great uh, question you have in the chat. So please keep track of that. Um, and also, if you have questions that you can save for later, that's great. If not, please just go ahead and email the authors. That's always a great way to get our questions in. So let's go ahead and move on to the next presenter. Um, let's see here. And I think we have... It's, it's me. I'm going to share my screen and Frederick and I are going to present. Okay. I have to put you as co-host before doing that. Yeah. All right. All right. You should have that. And whenever you're ready, Jamie. I don't know. Oh, yes, I can. Oh, should I also designate Frederick as a co-host? Um, no, I'm sharing my screen. Um, okay, you'll share it. Okay. You can, yeah. All right, whenever you're ready. I think to me, I'm so technically challenged, I would sort of, it would take the rest of the time if I were to. I understand. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay, I guess I am, um, I'm the one that's gonna, gonna start. So uh, my name is Frederick Anderson. I'm presenting this paper with, uh, uh, with Jamie Lillian Daniel. We're with the O'Neill School uh, at IUPUI. We're also uh, affiliated with AEI. So we wanna say thank you for all that great support we've had for, for working with them. Um, so um, in this paper, we're going to take a little bit of a, of a, different, uh, uh, of a different approach. Uh, both Jamie and I are nonprofit scholars, and so we're coming at this from uh, a little bit of a, of a different angle, but hopefully we, we think you will find this, um, this interesting. So as you can see, uh, our, 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 the name of the presentation, what constitutes a new nonprofit? Uh, indeed, a very big, uh, almost philosophical question. Uh, and what we're gonna do is that we're going to focus on a, a much more sort of narrow aspect of this particular, particular focus. But we are gonna be using um, uh, data from uh, nonprofit arts organizations. And because so much of the, uh, uh, of the arts community uh, operate within the nonprofit sector, we do believe that this is indeed sort of highly relevant for, um, uh, for you guys as well. Um, so like I said, so both Jamie and I would say that we're interested really in the dynamics of nonprofit organizations, you know, I mean, how they, how they evolve and change. And, and for this paper, we're focusing um, on, on new organizations and, and, and where new organizations come from. 
And um, we know when we're looking at, and this is not, just not in the United States, but when we look at data across the world, that, that you know, the nonprofit sectors in a lot of countries are growing. There's a steady influx of new nonprofit organizations coming into, into, these, uh, into these nonprofit sectors. And understanding these new organizations are important for a lot of reasons. Um, they are a key building block of, of, of a civil, having a civil society. They contribute to uh, meeting social needs. They build social capital and so on. Uh, new organizations are also important because nonprofits also exit the sector. So you need them in order to, um, to replace organizations that are going away. Um, relevant for, you know, for this whole conference is that new organizations also tend to be carriers of new ideas and solutions. So they can be a source of innovation. Um, and more recently, which I think is, is, a, is an aspect that's worth considering, is that um, there's a recent research that shows that, that new nonprofits have really important employment effects not just for employing the entrepreneur who creates the organization, but actually as they grow, they add and create new jobs for people around them. And there is a very, very interesting paper uh, by uh, Habib um, uh, Kashlami and colleagues that just came out that showed that the effect of new nonprofits is almost the same as it is for new firms. So very interesting. So, so there, is, there, is, there is a lot of good reasons for looking at new nonprofits. Uh, a lot of these, uh, uh, but when we're looking at what the literature has discussed so far, a lot of emphasis is on why do we have nonprofits and why do nonprofits exist? And, and you may all be familiar with this, uh, explanations linked to market failure, government failure, uh, social origins theory of different countries because of their uh, because of their historical background have different types of nonprofit sectors. Um, there's also supply side elements. Dennis Young's famous book about sort of like that social entrepreneurs come come up you know to sort of to develop new nonprofits. So there's there's a rich literature on this. Um, one question that hasn't been uh, uh, studied as much though is that how do new nonprofits come into existence? And it's this, it's this aspect that we define as nonprofit entrepreneurship. So, uh, you know, rather than, so a lot of nonprofit scholarship assumes already existing organizations, but how do they actually come into existence? So that, that's sort of the, the element that we're looking at. And um, I'm not saying that this is, the, this is completely new because no one else has looked at it. There has indeed been research looking at these things. There is some example of literature that are digging into this. Economists have looked at it. For those of you who study social movements know that emergence is an important aspect of social movements, life cycle theory, and, and so on. And, and I'm not going to go through this, and we can definitely come back and talk more about sort of, because all of these have their own sort of like uh, benefits, and, but also shortcomings when it comes to sort of to looking at, at organizations. The one thing that, that we're interested here is the last one. So coming at this from kind of an organizational theory perspective. And, um, and what that means is sort of studying entry and exits of new organizations, particularly at sort of a large macro, uh, at a large macro scale. Uh, and you can see that in sort of a population ecology. So the next slide, Danny. Um, so what, however, doing this, studying entry and exits, and this is sort of coming to the question that we're really interested in here, is sort of um, uh, to study entry, we must have a starting point, okay? And, and this raises the question, when is a new profit coming into existence? Uh, and, and, and when do we want to, when do we want to study it as researchers and when do we want to understand nonprofits, uh, uh, from the very, very early, uh, early days? Well, the, the, the answer to that is, well, we want to understand them as early as possible, but this then ra raises the next question, which is the question that we're now going to be digging around is that how can we then identify nonprofits at this very early stage? Well, one idea is to sort of, we know that they're around and we can ask them, you know, as we see new nonprofits emerge. However, this is hard to do at a large scale. If we ever want to do sort of like large macro studies where we want to have uh, observations in the thousands, we, it's going to be hard to simply identify uh, entrepreneurs and then go out and sort of talk to them. So we need proxies, right? And, um, and what we're going to be doing, and what we're going to be doing in this project is that we're going to use uh, data from from the Data Arts Project to look at three different proxies to get an understanding of uh, how useful are they for thinking about uh, uh, sort of when a new nonprofit come into existence. So I'm going to leave it over to to Jamie and take it from here. Sure. So this is how we went about identifying entrepreneurship, identifying founders, um, and founding. 
we, as Frederick mentioned, looked at data arts. Um, data arts, for those of you who may not be familiar, um, have a, a whole host, like something like 90,000 arts and cultural uh, profiles with program and um, funding and all sorts of, of data. Um, what we were really interested in was organizations that were founded in or after 2000 and uh, that had variables for three specific founding dates. Um, the two that are common in administrative data are, are the incorporation date and the date of the IRS decision at, for IRS exemption, um, basically naming them as a nonprofit. So we found uh, initially 5,700 profiles. Our final sample, um, including organizations that had dates for all three events, um, we had 4,215 organizations. And the first thing we did was we just took a look um, at the dates that they reported for these three key events. And we assumed uh, in order of founding, incorporation, and exemption. And we identified some variation. We see on this middle line that from founding to IRS exemption, there's um, an average or a mean of, of two years, uh, but a standard deviation of almost two and a half years. Um, so there's time in between these events. And you can see this breaks down. There's about a year from founding to incorporation on average. And then um, from incorporation to um, IRS exemption is almost you know, a little less than a year. Um, but we see that, that there's time which tells us that um, you know, these organizations are in existence in some way before these common proxies uh, that we use. So assuming there's a flaw in assuming that the proxy date um, is, the, is identifying the formation or emergence of a new organization. So that was interesting in enough, enough of, in and of itself. Um, but we decided, you know, let's ask some people associated with the new nonprofit when the organization was founded and see what they tell us. Um, so we identified from our, our sample of 4,200 organizations, uh, we identified 1,184 that were founded in or after 2000, but first posted a profile with um, data arts in or after 2016. We sent this survey out in 2019, and so um, we were hoping to kind of mitigate some of the recall bias issues by hoping to get to the person who may have filled out the organization, the, the profile, um, or may have had you know, some, some information or knowledge about the founding. So we ended up with 244 usable responses, so 20.6 uh, percent response rate. Um, and so uh, what we did, um, and, and, and in terms of who responded, we've got our organization founders, 65% um, of our respondents were, identified themselves as founders. Um, but they also, of this group, 89% said they had additional roles. Um, so we found they were the board chair, they were the, the executive director, um, but a number of them were also affiliated. They were the artists like doing the services, the, the designers, the, the stage managers, so they were heavily involved with the, the projects or the, the missions of their organizations. 34% um, had previous start, startup experience, um, some for-profit, some non-profit, some both. And then the average startup team was about five people, although this did range from two to, to 20. Um, and so um, our key question was when, as in which year, was this organization formed? So we didn't give any guidance about, are we looking for IRS states or anything like that? We wanted to see what these founders or key informants would tell us. The dates that we got, so this was a year question, and the dates that we got, some of them matched one of the three reported dates from the data arts file. So, you know, for those organizations that had a match of one of the three dates, 91 of them, about 37%, match the IRS date. So, you know, that tells us IRS date as proxy, not bad, not necessarily great, right? Um, we do see, you know, additional matches for the date matching um, the founding column from data arts or the incorporation date. But here we have 30% that don't match any of the three dates uh, that we asked about. Um, so we had a follow up question, which was what was the thing that made you say we are an organization? Right, like w this is more than just an idea. Here we are, we have emerged. We, we consider ourselves an organization. And we got, um, for, for those who, whose dates did not match any of the three reported dates from the data arts file, we got, it, it was an idea 
that we had, or it was several years with strong community support and interest, or, or we saw the idea there. And even for those organizations um, that had a match, that matched the IRS date or the founding date from the data arts data, um, the impetus for saying we are an organization was, was a milestone, like a family, day, uh, family death or a conversation, or again, we see this idea of support, someone signaling that we support you. So what this shows us is that, you know, contrasting administrative data with the survey data, we see that, that it's really complex. It's hard to pinpoint when a new nonprofit starts, um, which then just leads to a host of methodological challenges facing people who want to know, you know, who want a clear answer. Um, you know, so when is a new nonprofit organization founded? Well, it depends, which if any of you have ever taken a class with me, that's not a surprise that that, that is the answer. Um, but what we see is that founding is a, it's a continuous process, right? It, it's not a discrete event. Also using the date as pro the IRS date as proxy might actually, we might be late to the game in identifying emergence, which has um, implications, for example, for liability of, of newness. Is an org really new just because it doesn't have an IRS date or hasn't listed it yet? Um, and actually kind of touching on some of the things that Ying brought up, there are implications for organizational signaling and sense giving who I say I am as an organization or when I say I'm an organization may be different than when you say it, right? Um, and so, you know, when does this matter? When does it matter that we don't have an exact date? It depends in some sense, oh, I just went back and I did not mean to do that, but um, <laughs> it depends on what you're looking for. IRS dates tell us something. And, you know, if you're thinking about within two years of, of an organizational founding, they tell us some sort of something. So if you're looking at an organizational age and looking at, you know, the age as a, as a control variable, for example, the IRS data is probably going to get you there, especially if you're looking with a large data set. It's a control variable, not explanatory, explanatory variable. Um, but tax exemption might actually signal the end of an emergence, or the end of the founding stage and not the founding itself. So if you're really interested in studying entry and exit rates and imprinting and impact, you know, you need to be transparent on what you're actually asking about. This also has practical implications. If you, for example, are a foundation that says, you know, we will only give grants to an organization that has existed for at least two years, kind of trying to confound that liability of newness. Well, what does that mean to be in existence? Who gets to define that? Or do you mean has only been tax exempt for two years? Because what we're showing is that in some cases, being in existence or having been founded might be, the answer to that might be different than when were you tax exempt and has different implications. Um, and as Frederick said, this was our take and it was a little bit broader. Um, we happen to be using arts and culture data, um, but the really interesting thing is being able to dig at these questions because a lot of the organizations with whom we spoke and reached out, the founders were there and were heavily involved in the nature of the work that is that is being done. So we think that's, that's a strength. Um, so um, we also want to acknowledge that we use data from the data arts and our interpretation is ours, not theirs. Um, but with that, we're happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Frederick. Thank you, Jamie. So any questions? It's a great paper. Pause to let anybody raise their hand or put in a chat. Did you have a statistic for how often the IRS data matched the data arts data? Uh, we had that, I believe, let's roll back, 37% um, of our, from our survey. Oh, I got it. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Oops, oh, sorry. <laughs> Questions for Jamie, Frederick? I think Ying has a question. Oh, there you go. Ying, go ahead. Yeah, uh, so, it's very interesting, this um, body of work, because my dissertation committee chair is a population ecologist. So I have been involved in this kind of work all the time. Um, and it's really meaningful to look at what happened before the actual founding of uh, not maybe not only a nonprofit, but also any kind of organization in a for-profit business areas as well. So what matters, uh, what intrigues me the most is um, your interpretation about what it really means to look at the period before the actual registration or founding of a nonprofit because going back to the art house uh, scenario actually a lot of art houses uh, used to be um, for-profit organizations but uh, as, as, as the world changed they find this really hard to balance their mission and financial sustainability so a lot of them just transformed to a nonprofit but they 
there are divergent views among uh, within this community. Some believe that uh, by transforming a nonprofit, they can keep their mission, but others think it's going to disrupt how they run their business because there will be board members who will trying to interrupt their business and they have to spend a lot of time writing uh, grants. So there might be this critical period within a pre-existing organization who's already there and for being a for-profit discussing what it really means to become a for-profit. So I'm just very interested, interested to um, understand what happened before the transition to a for-profit, a non-profit. It's just a, a very important question to ask. Thank you very much for it. Yeah, and I should say that we focus specifically on organizations that um, were not like a, didn't have a, finance, a fiscal sponsorship or were not, you know, like an affiliate necessarily. We were looking like purely at sort of individual organizations because we did get some questions from, if in Frederick, you may remember, um, I got, I was, the, the survey came from my email, so I would get all of these random emails back and um, we get some questions about, well, we were founded here, but then we really turned into this there and do you want that? And we're like, ooh, maybe, but we're also putting that in a separate folder for future follow-ups. You're trying to sort of get at sort of pure organizations for lack of a better word. No, I think I think I think it's a great question, Ying, and and it's mm -hmm. I, I, more than anything. What I think Jamie and I are trying to really stimulate here is to sort of to encourage people that as we want to try and understand not just new organizations but transition organizations and other types of initiatives, just the importance of of really paying attention to the to the very early stages of that as possible, and not treat that you know, uh, uh, you know, haphazardly, because one of the, you know, there's at least two things that are associated with, with emergence that, that we know are important. I mean, one of them is that emerging organizations tend to be extremely vulnerable during that time. So if we want to understand how we can support and, and stimulate new organizations to be successful, understanding that at the very early stage is going to be necessary. We can't, there is often a success bias in a lot of research that we're studying organizations that are already established. And and the other aspect of that is, is which I think is to, to Ying's point, is that a lot of the things that happen during this almost sort of nebulous stage, you know, maybe before incorporation and for tax exemption, those things have an imprinting effect on what it is to come. You know, I mean, a lot of important decisions and intentions are being conducted at that point. And if we ever want to sort of understand sort of the the temporal or causal mechanisms between sort of like, you know, I mean, early ideas, motivations and so on, and what leads to success and impact and so on, really paying attention to that early stage, I, I, we, we think is absolutely necessary. So, so I completely agree with you, Ying. I think it's a great point. We have one minute for questions, and I just wanted to highlight King Feng Wang's uh, from UC Riverside question in the chat. So in our field work, we found some businesses started a sister nonprofit organization to function as a platform for themselves or others in the same communities. Did you see the connection between business ownership and nonprofit birth? Um, we, the only question we sort of asked was this question about previous startup experience, but we, that's a really great point for us to consider that, that we didn't ask like, are your four, especially for this group of the 21%, like are your, your, your for-profit and nonprofit related or, or is there a connection? Um, so that was, um, a, that's a really interesting point for us. Yeah, to, it, to. It really is. I mean, it's a kind of a, almost like a, intrapreneurship form, right, where an existing organization spins off something new in the form of a new program or a new organization or a new initiative. So it's, a, and I don't think that we, we didn't explicitly look at that here, but it, it's definitely a very valid uh, uh, approach to sort of to consider. And I mean, I want to be clear with that too. We are not saying that entrepreneurship should only and can only be defined as the emergence of new organizations. There are a lot of different ways of thinking about entrepreneurship. It's the, it's just the emphasis that we're taking in this particular project. Thanks, Frederick. Thanks, Jamie. Great paper. We'll have more to discuss later on. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce our next panelist uh, and give you, sorry, I just have to find you. We are. All right. Jessica, you can share the screen. Oh. 
Okay, um, are we ready? All right. Um, hold on, I can't quite see who we need to. There we go. All right, um, good morning. My name is Jessica Sherrod Hale, and I'm pleased to present the results of an experiment that I recently conducted with Joanna here. Um, and we're both uh, at IU Bloomington at the O'Neill School. Um, in this study, we examined the role of artists in public sector innovation. So artists are often tapped by non-arts arts organizations like public sector agencies to contribute to organizational goals like innovation. And so today I'm gonna to present the results of our first attempt to study this question. Um, just to keep in mind, we are planning a new round of experiments for the coming year, and we'd really love to hear any feedback um, on our work uh, as we are planning those experiments out. Um, in addition to any feedback that you have on this uh, first round of experiments that we're presenting today. So I'll begin with a little bit of background on public sector innovation and artist residencies as an organizational intervention. Um, so we know uh, that public organizations face problems that are novel, ill-defined, and complex. And we also know from the creativity problem-solving literature um, that problems of this nature require creative problem-solving and innovation. So there just aren't known solutions to these types of problems. There aren't known methods to arrive at a single best solution. So in this study, we examine artist residencies as one potential means for public organizations to address these types of problems. So why study artists and residents as an organizational intervention? Well, artist residencies have long held an important place in developing the careers of artists. However, since the 1960s, these residencies have begun emerging in non-art settings like businesses, universities, and public agencies. Um, like traditional residencies, these unconventional residencies often offer a space for artists to develop and grow, but they are also often sponsored as an intervention to meet specific organizational goals. And one of these goals is often to enhance creativity and innovation. Though these programs have been growing in recent years, there really isn't much evidence that can speak to the causal impact. Um, there's just really been a diversity of organizations and outcomes and goals. And it's been difficult to develop some firm causal estimate um, among all of these different goals um, and outcomes. Um, though there have been some smaller one-off evaluations that indicate that those involved with residencies perceive, the, perceive these effects on creativity and innovation among many other um, outcomes. So um, we seek to fill this gap in the literature by testing the potential efficacy um, of this organizational intervention for public sector organizations. Uh, so we asked a simple question, do artist residencies increase innovation in public sector organizations? Um, so with this, we, we hope to address this broad question with our body of work um, over the next few years. Um, but with this uh, specific experiment that we present today, we um, look specifically at whether artists increase creativity in the idea generation and selection phase of the innovation process and specifically those that involve group problem solving. Um, and we do so with an experimental design that allows us to more cleanly isolate the causal effects of artist residencies. So um, to answer this question, we first consider what role artists are being asked to play um, in these programs and what theories may explain their efficacy in these roles. Um, and we begin our study by thinking of artists as artists excuse me, artist residencies as interventions that leverage artists as organizational entrepreneurs. Um, so here, I've briefly defined entrepreneurship um, as people or processes in organizations that bring about innovation from within the organization. So when an artist is bringing in, a, or when an organization is bringing an artist with the goal of innovation or creativity, they're really asking those artists to serve as entrepreneurs and bring about change or creativity from within that organization. So um, to design our experiment, uh, testing this role of artists as entrepreneurs, we first begin by considering what mechanisms um, or through what mechanisms they might operate. And first we consider whether artists as individuals have more entrepreneurial traits than public sector workers. So why would an organization bring in an artist rather than simply asking exi existing public sector workers to be an entrepreneur? Um, and some in this literature have suggested that pu the public sector as a whole has somewhat of an adverse selection problem. So because the sector is seen as risk averse um, and non-innovative, the theory is that more creative people, um, you know, pursue other environments that really prize their creative creativity um, and incentivize that creativity. Um, Artists, on the other hand, tend to work in entrepreneurial fields and have entrepreneurial tendencies, and art prizes and incentivizes creativity. 
Thus, we might expect artist residencies to offer public organizations an avenue to recruit creative people and entrepreneurial people. So we begin our study by considering what traits are valuable for entrepreneurs and creativity more generally. And first, we know that personality traits are important drivers of creativity, which is critical to entrepreneurship. And so specifically in this study, we focus on a few characteristics that have been most closely associated with entrepreneurs, artists, and creativity. Um, first, we look at extroversion, which has been linked to entrepreneurship and creativity. Um, and we define this along two dimensions, uh, sociability um, and enthusiasm on one dimension, and then the other, uh, which is assertiveness and dominance. And we expect that artists um, will follow the patterns uh, that have been found in the creativity liter literature of low sociability and high assertiveness. With respect to um, openness, uh, this is another characteristic that's been linked to creative achievement. And it can also be defined along two dimensions. Um, one, which is, uh, is termed openness, uh, and it reflects on the aesthetics and senses. And then intellect, intellect which focuses on the abstract and intellectual. Um, so artists have been shown to be higher in the openness dimension than other groups. And then finally, we expect artists to be more creative. Um, again, art is a creative enterprise. It requires novelty and adaptation. And so we would expect that artists would have this trait. Um, so because artists as entrepreneurs are thought to bring about organizational innovation, we also examine their contribution to group processes and the outcomes that these processes achieve. Um, so in this study, we focus specifically on the idea generation and selection phase of the innovation process, though artists certainly have the potential to contribute to other phases of the innovation process. Um, here we consider specifically the literature on group problem solving and what factors contribute to creativity in the generation and selection of solutions to those problems. Um, this literature suggests that more creative, um, uh, excuse me, this literature suggests that more creative groups are more diverse. And as we discussed on the previous slides, we believe that artists um, bring more entrepreneurial characteristics to public sector organizations. Um, this literature also suggests that artists may shape group processes, perhaps by generating conflict, um, which has been shown to benefit problem solving um, and elaboration where group members can build upon the creativity and perspectives um, of others in the group. And then finally, we expect that the introduction of artists uh, to the problem solving process will result in more creative solutions to public, public problems, which if implemented would result in more innovation. So in order to answer this question, we conduct a laboratory experiment. Um, we began by uh, recruiting participants with a pre-screening survey that limited participation to those working in public and nonprofit settings, and then artists who earn an income in the arts. We then invited participants to our lab in a black box theater, and we asked participants to work together to solve a novel, ill-defined and complex problem, which is just the type of problem that requires creativity. And then the key manipulation um, of this experiment was, at the, was the assignment of, of artists to half of the groups. And then the groups worked together on camera to write a solution to the problem, which they turned into us. And then the participants also completed several questionnaires as individuals. So um, to assess our hypotheses, we included several measures. Um, to test our first hypothesis, we looked at whether our artists have traits that are more characteristics of entrepreneurs than our public sector workers. Um, and we administer several individual questionnaires and tasks to assess this hypothesis. Um, so for extroversion and openness, uh, we use the big five aspect scale, which includes the dual dimensions for both of these aspects. Um, for creativity, we use two measures of divergent thinking. Um, so that we don't measure creativity directly here, divergent thinking is often considered an important precursor. And what this measures is one ability to generate novel and useful ideas. Um, so we administer two divergent thinkings tasks two divergent thinking tasks. Um, one, which is a realistic problems test from the RCAB battery um, that was independently developed and also independently scored um, by that, that test developer. Um, and this task asks participants to generate creative solutions to realistic problems. So for example, I forgot my report that's due at work this morning. Um, what do I do? Uh, and so participants try to generate as many um, creative solutions as they can uh, within a, a certain time frame. We also develop our own measure of divergent thinking by asking participants to brainstorm solutions to the experimental task prior to meeting their group. Um, and then we had raters count the number of unique responses and the overall number of responses for each respondent. So um, our second hypothesis focuses on the contribution of artists to the groups. So these measures are all at the group level rather than at the individual level. 
Um, we asked two raters to view video recordings of the groups collaborating and to count the number of conflicts and the degree of elaboration. Um, and the conflict rating is comprised of the average count of conflicts related to the task um, for the groups. And then the elaboration scale uses a, a Likert scale adapted from some other work in that area. And then finally, um, we uh, develop measures of creativity, novelty, and usefulness um, using the consensual assessment technique that's often used in this literature. Um, and we asked to, to implement this, we asked experts in local government in the region to rate the group solutions on, on these three dimensions. And then we average those expert ratings. So um, the results show some support for our hypotheses, but given the time limitations, I'm gonna skip some of the sample description Though I do have those tables at the end if anyone uh, has questions about those later. So um, for our first hypothesis, um, you can see that we do see some evidence that artists have higher openness um, than public sector workers. Um, and it appears that the level of extroversion, though, is uh, quite similar among these groups. Um, so here we report the results of a simple t-test and then also um, some regressions uh, results that control for some of the demographic factors that we collected. Um, here we examine the results of um, that first divergent thinking task, the uh, realistic problems task, and we see that artists appear to have more original ideas than public sector workers. Um, and with this fluency score here, uh, you can see that they generate more ideas overall. Um, we also calculate the average originality because uh, originality and fluency are highly correlated. And it appears that on average, the ideas supplied by artists though here are no more original than those supplied by public sector workers. Um, so we look at our own, the results of our own divergent thinking task, um, and here we can examine, um, we see that the overall number of original responses uh, and the total number of responses were no different, um, but on average, the responses provided by artists were more original. Um, so moving on to our second hypothesis, which again, these are all at the group level. Uh, here you do see we have a bit smaller of a sample size. Um, so we would need pretty dramatic differences between the groups to achieve statistical significance. Um, but first, if we look at the contribution of artists to group processes, um, Surprisingly here, our control group of public sector workers had more conflicts during the course of their collaboration. Again, the difference is not statistically significant, but this relationship would bear further investigation in a, a larger sample. Um, though there were no differences between the groups and the level of elaboration, um, we did see some, uh, that scale, uh, the raters tend to anchor on the higher end of that scale. It was a scale of one to five. Um, and so perhaps in this population and context, the level of elaboration might not be changed much by artists because it seemed that most of the groups were performing at the high end. Um, and then finally, we examined the consensual assessment technique ratings. Um, and here, uh, the raters used a scale of one to seven um, to, to rate creativity, novelty, and usefulness. Um, overall, the raters found that the responses were more useful than novel or creative. Um, the groups with the artists tended to have solutions that were rated as more creative and novel, while groups with public sector workers tended to rate solutions that were rated as more useful. Um, but again, given the sample size, we would need pretty large differences to see si statistical significance. Um, so uh, just to wrap up, uh, in this study, we find that artists may serve as public sector entrepreneurs. Um, we find that they can bring entrepreneurial characteristics to the public sector, particularly openness and divergent thinking abilities, both of which are highly linked to creativity. Um, thus, artists in residence programs may be a way to bring creative talent to the public sector. Um, though our sample size is small, we do find some evidence that artists may shape group processes and outcomes. Um, interestingly, groups with artists had less task conflict that we would ex expect more in diverse groups. Um, and this relationship and its medi mediating role with creativity really uh, bear further investigation, um, especially given our, our uh, outcomes on the creativity, uh, the creativity side of the study. So groups with artists had more novel and creative solutions, but not more useful ones. Um, so artists might contribute to idea generation and selection, but perhaps public sector workers are important for considering um, the overall feasibility during the selection phase. Um, finally, we are, uh, in, again, in the process of developing our plans for future experiments over the next few weeks. And we're considering a lot of different options, but some avenues that we are interested in are the role of artists in other phases of the innovation process. Um, so we might see the impact of artists on some aspect of the implementation phase. Um, we are also interested in examining other elements related to the interplay between artists, um, the arts, and other act 
actors in the innovation process. Um, so for example, does it exposure to an artist's rendering of the problem, um, the same problem that the, you know, the artists are working with the groups, does, does that exposure to that artwork change creativity and problem solving? Um, and then in ad addition to conflict and elaboration, we're interested in looking at how artists um, shape other aspects of the collaborative process. Um, and in addition to that, we are also planning to increase our sample size and replicate this first experiment as well. So um, I think I'm almost out of time here. Uh, so thank you for your time. I look forward to hearing your feedback on this study and our work moving forward. Thanks, Jessica. Uh, questions, comments? Anybody? I just want to note the end size too. Um, some of those uh, sample sizes were reflecting individuals, but others were reflecting groups. So the ones that we were looking at innovativeness um, outcomes, those were reflecting sample size and groups. So within each group, there was either there were three to five individuals. So, um, King Peng. Oh, great. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Very interesting paper. Um, and especially this experimental method is so interesting and innovative. Uh, I'm just wondering, um, I, I probably just need some more detail about how the design works. And especially, uh, I wonder how the experimental environment is similar to the real world, real world process which is highly contextualized, we know. And how could the difference impact the results? Mm -hmm. I know this could be a bigger question between the research design like this and the general observation or survey, but I'm just wondering how this difference could, whether there, I mean, I just want to understand it more. Thank you. Jessica. Okay. Um that's a really great question, and it's something that we've thought a lot about. Um, and so, when we were selecting the site, we were thinking about um, kind of, you know, if, if an organization is bringing an artist in with the goal of um, simulating creativity, right? We're we're kind of trying to come up with this um, some simulation of this kind of new creative environment, right? Um, and so that's why we chose that um, for the experimental task. Uh, in our work moving forward, though. Um, First, because of COVID-19, we're going to uh, try a more virtual environment, which um, will be different, right? Because that's what people are used to working in now. Um, so we're going to be conducting the experiments over Zoom, and it'll be interesting to see how that takes hold. Um, and then we do have some work uh, for later in the future, or some plans for later in the future, um, that will place artists with groups that are used to working with one another, right? So sending them to that workplace, or, um, you know, we've talked about, uh, like, conferences. Sometimes you see these, you know, artists uh, coming to conferences to help groups brainstorm and things like that. Um, and maybe using that as an experimental setting um, where you're actually a part of people's day-to-day -day work rather than giving them, assigning them a task. So um, assigning, you know, the task allowed us to really control for um, a lot of factors that haven't been able to control, that people haven't really been able to adequately control for in the past, but, you know, we, we kind of give up some of that generalizability with that but hopefully some of the stuff that we do moving forward will address that. Yeah, the study that Jessica points to, the one that's coming up is not only replicating these to get our end, to get our sample size larger, but we're also doing this large scale validation experiment in order to address exactly your question. So that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, other questions, comments, before we move into a general discussion? Um, thanks, Amy, for your comment in the chat box. That's really, really helpful. Good. Well, if there aren't any other specific questions about this paper, and we can just continue. We have about 10 minutes left in the session to just have a general overall discussion. If you didn't get to ask your question about a previous paper, this is now the time. Um, or if you just want to talk a little bit more about sort of synthesis something like that, please feel free. So anybody want to offer a comment or have a question that they didn't get to ask? I know there were three questions for the first paper that we didn't get to. So if you want to ask, Jamie. Yeah, um, Ying, I was, I was wondering when you're talking about sort of um, like the effects of virtual um, um, cinemas and how they might be sort of this poison pill um, for the cinemas to go, to go online, but you also noted that the core audience doesn't really like the tech or has resistance to it. And so I'm wondering if, 
if you're looking at or if you've seen sort of a, a, a difference in terms of longer, shorter term or immediate effects and long term effects, because it might be that the core audience um, are willing to use the streaming now because better that than nothing. But like once they're able to go back, you know, you might see a resurgence or, or a rebound, at least in the shorter term, given like the, the core audience being elderly and their preferences for, for going to the live event versus people who either may be more cautious for whatever reason or who, who may be more used to streaming? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. I think this is a question that art house uh, managers also dying to know um, because, but theoretically, I can separate the audience into two types. One is cinephile, so that could include younger audience, but the other type is really gray haired audience who are just used to going to movie theaters to watch a movie. So uh, my speculation is that during this time, virtual cinema is more well received by those younger cinephiles, but not those gray haired audience. But those gray hair audience are also the mostly impacted by the coronavirus because of all kinds of reasons. And even after the theaters are reopened, they are hesitated to go out to mingle with a couple of people for health uh, related issues. So this is really a question that our houses uh, are eager to figure out in the future. So I, I can't have a definite answer to that question, but that's this really important question to think about. Um, I saw Shoshana's hand up. Does she? Shoshana? Yes, I put my hand up. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, this question is really for the first two presenters because it's really about uh, it's about arts nonprofits and it's about my question is with the current pandemic and about fundraising because I know that Ying, you talked about that the art house cinema houses were kind of thinking about supplementing their revenue with some fundraising. And I know that that would apply to emerging uh, arts nonprofits as well. So my question to all of the scholars is, have you found any data? Are you doing any research about how this is affecting the fundraising in arts nonprofits? The COVID. I will, I guess, oh, I, no one's going to say anything. I, I, uh, no, I haven't looked at arts nonprofits in, in specifically. I know that there is, um, I know that there is an initiative going on in the uh, Lilly School of Philanthropy, um, you know, which also IUPUI, um, where they are looking at sort of like trying to understand the impact uh, of, of what's happening right now on, on things like charitable giving and, and donations and so on. But I want to say that that is, that is very much ongoing. And I don't know, Jamie, maybe you know, but I don't think that they have really produced anything quite yet. But that's, that's definitely going to be, uh, that's definitely going to be a, a major, a major thing to look at. Um, what, what I do know and what I've seen is that, which is an interesting twist on the concept of social entrepreneurship that has been applied in the nonprofit sector, where there's been this push for doing more earned revenue, right? You know, I mean, going more commercial and how that is, is in a sense now backfiring. You see those organizations that rely very, very heavily on having people coming in sort of, you know, paying fees or paying, uh, you know, and so on is actually being, being hit very, very hard by this. And that includes many, many arts organizations, whereas those that might have rely on, uh, on individual donations and so on or might, might not be as hit. Um, but I do think that that's going to be, uh, that's going to be something that we're going to see. Um, and there's been some interesting stuff done uh, based on uh, uh, lessons from the recession, uh, where people have, have studied and looked into that. And there's, there's quite a lot of new interesting data coming out on that. Uh, the nonprofit quarterly just devoted their entire recent issue to sort of talking about what happened, lessons learned from the recession and how we can think about that for what's happening right now. So that might be a good story. Into. Yeah, and I do just want to add, we know that organizational death, regardless of the cause, we, we saw it in our own sample where we were looking for orgs that first put a profile up in 2016, and they weren't in existence in 2019 when we were trying to find them. Mm -hmm. um, and we did identify a core group that were interested in 
follow-up surveys and follow-up conversations, there was a lot of interest in and response and that. And obviously when we set out on this research, we didn't have sort of what follow-up, we had some ideas of what the follow-up might be and looking at sort of organizational depth and, and impact. Um, we haven't talked specifically about that, but it's sort of, a, it, it is a, a question mark in terms of what do these organizations look like now, especially the, the nascent ones. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I'd like to add um, about the, how the art house community are trying to fundraise. It's interesting to observe that they are interpreting fundraising during this um, challenging times as an ethical issue because they understand this is a hard time for everyone. How can we ask money? So art houses are trying to be creative in their fundraising activities and virtual cinema is actually also an opportunity for people that are willing to support art houses during this time to um, to donate some money but also in the form of watching uh, being able to watch a film online but actually not every person watch the films online sometimes they just want to buy a virtual ticket to support the theater and the theaters are also trying to sell gift cards uh, sell membership in advance so that um, people they can promise people if we are able to reopen we can return the, return the services to you as long as they can get some cash flow to uh, weather this storm um, so yeah they are they are eager to learn about the fundraising opportunities, but they also hesitant to 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 make a big too big a step to, to in terms of that. Thank you, uh, Ying. There's a question for you in the chat box from Sabrina Pratt. Do you see any relationship, I, I believe, with your work to what might be happening with the film festivals going virtual? Yeah, that's a great question because the film industry is such an ecosystem. So every part of the filmmaking um, process is interrupted. But I think film festivals might be even more interrupted than art houses because even if they go virtual, but because people go to a five day or three day film festival for so many social purposes. So so that part, once that part is ripped off from uh, from from the ability of film festivals. I don't really think people are excited to go to an online film festival. It's just, uh, it's, it's already ironic to call a ticket virtual ticket, then I don't know what it means to be a virtual festival. I'm, I'm just saying this from a from regular customer's point of view, but I really respect the film festival professionals who try to pivot as much as possible and try to um, deliver some of the valuable films and the underrepresented voices from those minority groups to, to convey their ideas through the media of film. I think it's really important to do it right now. I'm just not sure what does it mean for consumers to accept the idea of a virtual festival? Mm. Thanks, Ying. We have two minutes left. Any last questions or comments? We have a little break. Um, great. Well, if you do have anything that you'd like to send the authors, please go ahead um, and do that. I, I believe we should all have emails, but if not, it will, we'll think about facilitating email exchange after the fact too. Thank you all for your presentations. They were really wonderful. Um, staying on time also, thank you so much. So let's take a little bit of a break, 15 minutes, and then either pop into track A or track B at 1215 for the next panel. So thanks everyone. Thank you.